an interview with a U.S. special operator who's repurposing his talents to take down sex traffickers. We're going to talk about it on today's Hot Zone. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, Chuck Holton here. Thanks for watching The Hot Zone. You know, being out here on the farm, it's hard to believe that there is so much evil in the world, but all you have to do is make the mistake of turning on the evening news or just turn on the TV and you'll see that there is a tremendous, tremendous amount of evil in this world. And, you know, I always have just so much respect for people who try to do something about the evil in the world. And my friend Jeff Teagues is one of those. He's an American hero, walk and talk and war hero. He has been uh, years, as a, almost a decade, as a very high level special operator been on hundreds and hundreds of combat missions. And when he retired from the military, he wanted to keep using his talents to free the oppressed. And so that's what he did, set about doing. He's been working for a company called Guardian Group until just a few weeks ago when he took a job with Victor Marx's uh, organization. And uh, he's going to be doing the same thing for Victor Marx that he was doing with Guardian Group. And so I got a chance to interview him when I was in Portland a few weeks ago, and I want to share that interview with you now. And the interview was specifically about sex trafficking and what it's like in the United States today. You might think of sex trafficking as being something that happens to people elsewhere in other countries. Go to Thailand, go to Indonesia, go to some of those kind of sleazy countries uh, that they're not sleazy countries. They're, they're sleazy people for sure. Uh, but where, where sex trafficking is very common, that's what you might think of, but you might not realize the extent of sex trafficking in, in the United States until you talk to Jeff Teagues. Listen to this. The scope of the problem is, is hard to imagine. Okay, so one thing that, that, that we need to understand is there's human trafficking, and that is the umbrella term, and that includes labor trafficking and sex, sex trafficking. That's a global problem. So let's narrow it down to just sex trafficking, not, not, not including labor trafficking. Now, when you have sex trafficking, there's all sorts of flavors to that as well. There is uh, brothels, there's, there's prostitution, street prostitution, there's massage parlors, there's all, there's all sorts of things to it. Um, the commercial sex trafficking is what we focus on, Guardian Group, and that is girls and women. There are men and boys also, but the, the predominant market is, is girls that are being sold online for sex. And there are 150,000 new sex ads a day in America. There are millions of sex ads at any given time in every state, every city and town in the United States. It's, it's a, equivalent to you going to a, a site, almost literally like Googling, to go to Amazon. You, you go to these websites that are specifically selling women and you order what you want. You put in where, you're, where you want them to be delivered to, what it is you're looking for, and then you can shop through the menu of what these different women will offer for their sexual services. So you, you have to think of this as a business. And, and think of the marketplace that has moved online. I, this is the second time I'm mentioning Amazon, right? We're, we're, you, it's hard for a mom and pop store to, to survive. You've got these large box stores like a Walmart that can barely survive against Amazon. The same thing has happened in the commercial sex industry. If a woman is standing on a street corner, how many people are going by her? Look at, look at, look at the availability of, of, the, of who's going to buy her. But if she is for sale online or a trafficker can sell 10 women all at once online, what we see a lot of times, if you're looking at Portland, they will advertise for Portland and surrounding areas. So you're not confined to a street. You're confined to a county or even multi-state region. So the, the, the access for the buyer is huge. To say nothing about the safety, because when you have street prostitution and people drive by it, they call law enforcement and they complain. And they say, get this off our streets, please. When it sits online and you don't see it, because you don't go to the escort site, so it's, it's, it doesn't exist to you because you don't, you don't see it. You're not forced to see it. But 
you know, it, it's there and it's thriving. So not only is the supply much easier to market and sell online, the demand is much more accessible, but there's even an, another aspect to it, and that's the recruitment phase to bring these girls in. Um, so talk about that. Yeah, we have, we have stories of traffickers that would sit in a hotel room like this with 10 different computers running. And, the, and five of the computers were active sales, so they were, they were running girls for sale. And the other computers, were, they were running personas, where they are on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. You, you name the app. That they're, they're on those apps recruiting girls and looking for their vulnerabilities. And Chuck, what are our young ladies sharing online these days? Everything. They're, many of them are sharing their geolocational data because they don't, they don't recognize how they can be tracked. And they're sharing their, their deepest, darkest fears and vulnerabilities. So when, when you're online, and you're talking about how you just had a fight with your mother or how you broke up with a boyfriend and you're, and you're having some self-esteem confidence issues, these predators are out there. They're, they're waiting to, to see that, and they pounce upon that, and they use that tiny little crack, that, that moment of weakness to, to, to wiggle their way in. Self-confidence and self-esteem is, is the armor against these, these traffickers, against these predators. Now, unfortunately... Every girl, every woman goes through that maturation cycle where their self-esteem and self-confidence wanes. And, and when does that happen? It happens in your early teens. It happens that when you're 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, that's the natural process. Otherwise, uh, you'd never leave home, right? <laughs> like you're, you know, you, your children at some point have to want to separate themselves from their parents. That's a, that's a, God built that as, a, as our biology. But, but what also is built into that now is, is a vulnerability. So that is why traffickers are looking at that age range. It's not that the huge market is for a 15, 16-year-old girl, but that's the girl that he can manipulate and control and, and get to do simple little things that she then becomes ashamed of. So how does that work? So most of the time, the trafficker is posing as something that he is not. Um, often it's the boyfriend, you know, like he shows interest in, in the young lady. Um, sometimes they have other women that are actually online befriending these women, you know, be, be, befriending these girls. So it almost always starts as a friendship. It could be a boyfriend type friendship or just a peer friendship or this young lady who's just looking for a place to belong. You know, a group of people, almost, almost this idea that men have with gangs, but that these, that these girls have where they're trying to find a, a home. And what's, What's, what really breaks my heart about, uh, I mean, a lot of things break my heart about this crime, but one of the things that, that is especially difficult is when you, when you look at the terms they use. They call them, they call, what, what, what does the victim call the trafficker, the pimp? Daddy. That's, that's what they call them. They call them daddy. They call the other girls sisters. They call the group their family. They call them sister wives. So you can see this psychology where the trafficker is manipulating these young women and trying to give them something that they need. They need a community. They need a family. But then what does the trafficker call the girls? His stable. A stable like you would talk about a stable full of, of animals. You know, so just that difference in the psychology is, it gives you a really good idea of, of what's happening out there. The... the Victims, they, they, they refer to their experience as the life. They call it the life, in and out of the life. The trafficker calls it the game. So it's another idea there where there are two very different things that are happening, and that male is taking advantage of the innate things that females go through as they're looking for a mate and a family and self-esteem and connection. They are constantly online. So they are on every app that you can imagine and they have very different personas. They, they will pretend they're a 13-year-old boy or they'll, they, they'll pretend that they're a 24-year-old man who has a, uh, a music contract. You know, he's in the music industry or modeling or something like that. Most of the time, though, it's really quite simple. It's just they'll, they'll pretend that they are near the age of this girl and they'll, and they'll begin to befriend her. 
and they'll begin to figure out what her vulnerabilities and weaknesses are. Do, does she have come from a, a history of, of abuse? So a girl that's been abused in her life sexually by her father or an uncle or a, or a, a boy or mom, her mother's boyfriend, that's not a huge leap, is it? That's not a huge leap to begin to make money for selling your body. They're already being abused and they're getting nothing for it. So when that predator can find that girl that has that level of vulnerability in her life, that's an easy pull from, him, from, from them. But those types of girls come with a lot of baggage too. They, they, come, they come from a lot of brokenness. So girls like your daughters, girls like my niece, my niece and the people that are in our lives, and, and, and girls that, that are in church, that is a stable, confident woman enough to be have a high value. We, there's a story right here in Portland, and she does she doesn't live here anymore. Otherwise, I would have I would have introduced you to her. She was purposefully targeted by a trafficker because she came from a well-to-do Christian family, and he'd been in the business for a long time, and. To get the small potatoes, to get the girl who comes from a, a broken, abusive relationship, that didn't, that didn't stroke his ego. But for him to be able to pluck a pretty young woman from a Christian family in the suburbs and turn her out to sell her body for sex through him, to be trafficked, that was an ego boost for him. So not, not only are our girls vulnerable just by the nature of this business, there are particular traffickers that, that will target Christian girls. And here's the catch on that too. When you come from a broken home, when you come from a home that there's abuse, physical, sexual, emotional abuse, what do you think the level of shame is in that, in that girl's life? She, very low, because she's lived with all of this chaos. But a Christian girl, right, who comes from a stable family, Imagine her level of shame. If, if he can get a girl to swear, if he can get a girl to do some, send him a, a picture of her nude, or if he can get her to receive a picture of him nude, or if he, you know, if he can get her just to do a little thing that she's going to then be ashamed of, that's that crack that he then exploits. And we as believers, we have to do a better job of, of protecting our young women on making them feel safe, that when they make a mistake, they can come to us. They can come to the church. They can let people know they made a mistake and they're ashamed of this. That is what the trafficker is counting on. He's counting on that shame and he's counting on that judgment from us as believers to push her away. So in many places in America, COVID had no effect. Um, especially in these places where the, the numbers of COVID weren't high. When you talk about New York City and some of these, we call them the, like these major markets, there was a drop in demand because the buyers were just simply afraid to, to purchase sex. In middle America and in most, of, most places in the United States, there was no drop in demand. You did not see, you did not see any change whatsoever. There was some movement, like we, we live outside, we, you know, we live a couple hours away from Portland, so you didn't quite see the movement as much from Portland out to a bunch of these suburbs, but the, the market largely stayed solid outside of these major markets. Now, what went into overdrive was the recruiting, because now you had millions of young, young women and girls that are stuck inside, and where are they spending their time? They're online. So when a trafficker sees a, a drop in his profits, a drop in his revenue, he's going to make that up somehow. And their recruiting efforts went through the roof. And they were able to access all of these girls that they otherwise wouldn't have accessed because, because they had the time. So I think the worst is yet to come. Even if we just take out the defund the police. Okay, let, let's, let's, let's not even discuss that side of it. Just COVID alone has forced budget cuts in, in, in every government entity across states, cities, towns, villages. Regardless of the defund the police, there are budget cuts that have to be made in every city. In the city that we sit in, they're, they're, they're slicing their uh, special victims units. 
Los Angeles has, has eliminated much of its special victims units. New York has. In the city that I live, the one detective that was tasked with sex trafficking has been, has been retasked because of all the cutbacks. So just from COVID alone and the budget cuts that were required, much of the effort that has been put into sex trafficking, the successes we've had over the last few years, are, are wiped out. There, there are people who run with it. Um, and they will respond. So one of the reasons that Guardian Group focuses on the minor is if a girl is under 18, that's not a prostitution charge, that's a trafficking charge. Any cop in America will jump on that. So we, we really try to focus on that. Unfortunately, it's, it's harder to see with the websites that are out there. If, if the girl is over 18, and, and we really look for uh, victims that are advertised between the ages of 18 and 25, because that's where you're, you're gonna find the minors. If she's over 18, it will have to get into the basic cycle of, of the law enforcement action. But we still have those relationships. We still have those partners. Just because they're not being funded for it does not mean these men and women in blue don't have a heart for it. Even, even before the budget cuts, most of the people we worked with were taking this on as, as a personal initiative, something above and beyond what was expected of them in their, in their duty day. Parents have to talk to their daughters very candidly about what's out there. You know, I think, um, especially in, this, in, the, in the Christian bubble that a lot of us live in, we don't fully appreciate the evil that's out there and the evil that's trying to work its way in, into our lives. So we have to help them understand and recognize what, what that evil looks like and what, you know, um, this idea, okay, that, <sighs> Chuck, we've had dozens of cases lately where young women are talking with older men online and that older man is paying them just to talk to them. And then it leads to, we're gonna to go to dinner. You know what I mean? We, we have to explain to these young girls, there is no 50 year old man on the planet that wants to pay them for their company, okay? It is, it's gonna to lead to something bad. Cause, cause you, you understand how, how simple that is? The, uh, the young girl rationalizes it, you know? He pays me $50 to spend an hour just talking to him online. He's gonna pay me $200 to go out to dinner with him. They don't, they don't see the evil behind it, okay? That's all the process. So we have to teach our, our daughters, our young women, that the evil exists out there. And then, again, I have to go back to that concept. We have to create that safe space for them to talk to us. We, dude, I knew you as a young man. You knew me as a young man. We made a lot of mistakes. I'm ashamed. I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of. I'm ashamed of plenty. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't go that far because my idea. Okay, but you know, the we have to create that space for our young people to come to us when they've made a mistake and when they're scared. And this is so easy because as 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 believers, that's that's who we are. You know, come, come and and talk and get the grace. Give the grace to these young people when they make a mistake. So the, front, the fir very first thing is help them understand the evil that exists out there. Mm -hmm. The second one, as equally as important, is, is create that, I, that, that bubble of grace surrounding our young people so that they feel comfortable to come to us when they make a mistake or they get caught in something. It doesn't matter. There is, there is no parent that's gonna stay ahead of their children. There, there, there are new apps being created every day and there are plenty of apps out there that are, that are designed to hide them from your parents. So the, the effort to continue to, to check up on your kid, it, it's, a, it's a waste of time. The, it's the bigger umbrella of, of creating that open, that open space and that open environment. Now, there are things uh, along that continuum. One of the easy ones of that continuum that we tell people is have this open dialogue with your kid and when they download a new app and create an account, have them come to you Download that app on your device, create an account for you, and, and make sure that you're, that you're friends and you're connected. You know, I mean, to me, I don't think that's all that invasive. I don't think that's all, um, you know, it's not, it's, it, seems like, it seems like a happy medium, right? right. You, whatever you want to download, you download it, you create one for me, and make me a friend, and we can, I can monitor it from a, from a distance. We need to help our children to be discerning, not deceitful. Th those are two very counterproductive things. If we can help them discern between good and bad 
and threats and things as they move, move along and not force them into the deceit side. And I think when, a, when a, a parent comes down too heavy, you're forcing them into deceit versus discernment. The special forces motto is Dio Preso Liber, free the oppressed. And I, I didn't realize until I retired that that motto was not something that was simply on our paraphernalia, on our uniforms, on our, on our badges, but it, has something that, it, it is something that's sunk into my body. To free the oppressed is a mission that I will carry until I die. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.